Thanks for listening to the Pop Culture Cosmos and the PCC Multiverse. Check out more great podcasts today on one of these awesome affiliate networks. You're listening to a Weeby Geeks Network podcast. You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. The Tangibound Network. Check it out. Tangiboundnetwork.com. Listen to this show, the latest episode, every time. A proud member of the Gunna Geek Network. The opinions expressed are those of each individual. Check out all the other geeky podcasts over at GunnaGeekNetwork.com and get ready because geekiness begins in three, two, one. On this week's episode, Bridgerton heats up on Netflix. Will there be a Borat 3? And could Microsoft have bought Nintendo? All this and more as we reach our next stop, the PC Multiverse. Don't be alarmed. The quasi-shimmering light before you is a trans-dimensional gateway to other worlds, other voices, other thoughts, and other realities. Up feels like down, and down feels like the number seven on a Wednesday morning. Don't worry. That quivering, blood-boiling sensation under your eyebrows is all a part of the charm. Welcome to the PCC Multiverse. And we're back with another episode of the PCC Multiverse. This is Gerald Glasser from Pop Culture Cosmos, Game Source, Inside Sports Fantasy Football, and the Lakers Fast Break. We truly appreciate everyone out there listening to all of our great shows. And if you can, please give us that five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Plus, if you can like, share, subscribe, follow, or do anything that you can to support us right here at the Pop Culture Cosmos, or even our friends at the Lakers Fast Break. And you can do that by going ahead to thrivefantasy.com if you're interested in daily fantasy sports betting player props on the NBA, Major League Baseball, the NFL, eSports, and PGA. If you are interested in that, you download the app or you go ahead to thrivefantasy.com and type in the code LFB on your first deposit at checkout. And if it's up to $50, they'll match it dollar for dollar as long as your first deposit is at least $20 or more right there at Thrive Fantasy. But it wouldn't be a PCC multiverse without my good friend. He returns to us once again coming home after being lost in the wild for many weeks it is my good friend indeed you got to go ahead and reach out to him on the twitter or instagram at castle fpv that's castle with a k right there for you it is my good friend it is marcus de la garza and marcus happy new year to you a blessed one for you and your family i cannot thank you enough for returning back to us here in 2021 well, same to you with a happy new year and, uh, you know, best wishes to your family and, and everybody with you. You know, it's, it's one of those things and with by with you, I mean, the pop culture cosmos family. It's one of those things I, I, I was sad to be away for a couple of weeks there, but I'm glad to be back and I'm looking forward to the show, man. It's going to be a good day of discussions. Well, you have found your way back to us here home at the pop culture cosmos and we truly appreciate it, but we got a great episode, including we have to have to have to have to have to hear your thoughts on the back end of the show about your best of 2020, because I know you've got a lot of best for 2020 Mm -hmm. and your most anticipated for 2021 in pop culture. And we'll hear about that on the back half of the show. Plus we got a great interview coming up with Jonathan Gatsby, the author of the beasts and the four demigods that's available. Now a great fantasy book for you right there for you. Hopefully it's the next Harry Potter the next Maze Runner, the next Hunger Games, any of those type of fantasy type books that are out there. If you're interested in getting into a new series, check out The Beast and the Four Demigods from Jonathan Gatsby, and he's coming up on the back half of the show as well. Plus, also, we're going to be talking a lot about Borat 3. Is that a possibility? Microsoft buying Nintendo? Could that have been a possibility? And uh, I had a very good time with the Movo VSM7 microphone. Hopefully, we'll be able to hear about that on the show as well. But first up, my friend, Bridgerton is steaming up. Steamy, steamy, steaming, steaming up the Netflix charts. It is right now currently, as we speak, number two on the charts behind Cobra Kai. Cobra Kai. 
which I watched and binged through this past weekend. And I shared my entire series review, non-spoilers, on Monday's episode. Because I didn't mm. want to give it away too soon because it just came out on the first. But Bridgerton is not too far behind a brand new series that just came out. Steamy, steamy, steamy hot. Everybody is talking about it. Possibly the next Fifty Shades of Grey type sensation in that sense as far as adult situations and steamy romance. So I want to hear your thoughts on Bridgerton as it now steams up on Netflix. Yeah, man. I think steams up and, and calling it uh, super steamy hot. is right on. Hot. Yeah, hot. It's hot. You know, one of the reviews I, I was reading earlier and pretty pretty well put was on a scale of zero to Outlander, what would this be when it comes in terms to steaminess? It was a six is what the author gave it. I think it would probably be a little bit higher than that. But my personal opinion, it's going to keep going up, man. I, this is a really popular thing. I, I feel like everybody in my life is talking about it right now. Just on our family thread, our family text message thread last night, I got a, has anybody watched Bridgerton? And four or five different responses. Oh my God, it's great. You have to watch it. You know, it's something that I think our household is excited about. We're going to try and binge it all this weekend. And maybe I can give my thoughts next week on the actual series itself. But, you know, my wife really, really, really took interest in it when, it, when she found out that Julie Andrews was going to be the, the narrator for the entire show. So I think this is going to be one that's going to be binge watched in our household and it's going to, con going to continue to be binge watched around the country. 63 million households, man. I think that's that's the pace they're on right now, right? That's correct. As of yeah. this recording, Netflix has reported 63 million households have already tuned into the Bridgerton series, an episode at least. So that's a, a great note. Obviously, that means a season two for the series. And I wanted to ask you this. I know we discussed it on the Monday episode, Josh and I, on whether to binge or not to binge. And I know I had to, for the show, binge through Cobra Kai, but I also enjoy event television when it comes to The Mandalorian and what I've seen over the course of the mm -hmm. past year or so because of what the pandemic has done. A lot of the networks out there have seemingly spaced out their content in more of a week-by-week -week fashion. But I want to hear your thoughts, my friend, on this before we go ahead and continue on the Bridgerton sensation. And that is, do you like and prefer binging or, like I said earlier, in the case of The Mandalorian, a week by week event television to me it depends on what i'm watching you know if it's something that's super high quality i would prefer to have it come out week by week i know myself i know i'm just going to destroy whatever you put in front of me netflix amazon prime hulu don't do it to me don't put me in that situation amazon prime saving me for myself right now with the expanse this season they're only giving us weekly releases after the first three came out uh, on week one so and I think um, that's their MO because they did a similar thing with the boys. The first three episodes, then they tease you week by week. Well, and, you know, to j just put it in, in perspective there, you know, last year they released the entire season in one go. And, you know, I still binged it in three days. Right. Like it, it just I think that something quality like that, something that I really appreciate, you know, give it to me week by week. It's going to have a better impact. But I mean, I don't need to. <laughs> I don't need a week by week release of Bridgerton. I don't need a week by week release of the crown. You know, those are things that I don't want to call them background noise because they're beautiful productions, but uh, it might be a little bit of background noise in my head, at least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell so, that to the missus. Don't I, tell I, that I, to the missus. Yeah. But, and, and not to say I don't enjoy them because this most recent season of the crown was outstanding. And the season before that I really enjoyed because it had so much history to it. But to answer your question, it's a little bit of both. It depends on what I'm watching. You know, if it's something that's really outstanding, give it to me week by week. Well, it's something that we're going to be gauging further and further as far as the tastes for the individuals. It's obvious that Netflix is going to stick to the binge watch television because that gets them those early slamming numbers. And man. I'm slamming my fist at those numbers right away, as opposed to just trying to weed it out week over week over week. And Disney plus seems to have that mentality of spreading things out while Netflix is just like pfft, splat everything right there for you. So it's kind of a different story now. It's a different mentality. When you go to Netflix, now you're expecting a binge. When you go to Disney Plus, you're expecting a week by week. So it's it's going to be interesting to see if fans' taste, viewers' taste will dictate one way or the other. And if they'll start demanding, hey, I want this all in one shot, or if I want to continue on this on a week by week basis, which is what is easier for my schedule and my lifestyle. But we'll wait and see how that pans out. But 
It is Bridgerton. And like I mentioned, Netflix has reported 63 million households have already gone and seen at least one episode of Bridgerton, which is an amazing number for at least a debut season with not too much hype to it. No, not, not at all. Too yeah. much interest or advance notice on it. It just caught wind. It caught fire. And a lot of people are really excited about it. Well, and there's one more I want to mention that Netflix has had a boom on, and that was a Midnight Sky. The or movie the with Midnight George Sky. Clooney, directed yeah. by him. Yeah, I mean, outstanding. We watched it. I, I thought it was outstanding. You know, it's and and I don't want to overshadow Bridgerton, especially since we're in a totally different category, jumping over to the movie category. But you know, Netflix is is knocking it out of the park, uh, at least in December. You know, they, it it was rumored they were going to cross that 200 million subscriber threshold. So if they did, congratulations to them. They deserve it. They've been killing it lately. And to do so in a Christmas time where both Disney Plus and HBO Max went up sharply as far as their subscriber base, obviously with Wonder Woman 1984 and also as well Pixar's Soul coming to those platforms. And if you look at the numbers from there and what's being reported upon, that the numbers went up sharply for both of those outlets. If they were still able to go ahead and climb over the 200 million subscriber mark at netflix kudos to them for doing so in a time where you could see a lot of people leaving the network just because there's so much out there that's offered not to mention peacock going back uh, you know now and getting the office now full-time yep. and they have exclusive footage from the office that netflix didn't have so peacock is now also going to be getting more viewers as well so that's going to be very interesting how that plays out how does Netflix still handle this situation as far as subscribers are concerned going forward? Again, with the content, Midnight Sky was also in the top 10 as far as what's hot right now on Netflix. But at number one, Cobra Kai, and not far behind was number two, Bridgerton. Cobra Kai, to me, was a tremendous success once again, and I hope everybody gets a chance to check it out. Look forward to going ahead and checking out some episodes of Bridgerton. I know that Everybody is, like you said, talking about it. I know my wife's work, they're talking about it constantly about Bridgerton. So hot. It's so hot. But it is something that I think a lot of people are talking about as far as you just, you just laugh at it when I say, so hot. hot. <laughs> it, it's almost Will Ferrell. It, it is, man. Yeah. It is. It's, social media is in love with it right now. Well, uh, the way you say it, it's so hot. It's like Will Ferrell doing it. Starsky and Hutch, I think, you know. So as hot. A... So hot. <laughs> But I tell you what, it is Bridgerton. It is on Netflix right now. If you're interested in a steamy, romantic, hot series, this is definitely up your alley. And this is something that a lot of people are, are taking note of. And it's definitely going to get a season two. I mean, this is one of those ones that's not on the cut line or people have to worry about or devoted fans have to be concerned whether or not it's going to be canceled. This is getting another season from Netflix. I think you can pretty much bet the house on that if it hasn't been confirmed already. 63 million reasons to renew it is where we're at right now. Absolutely, indeed. What are your thoughts out there on the steamy, hot, hot Bridgerton series from Netflix as I make Marcus choke on his water? Share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Hey, this is Chad from Ghost Toasters, and you're listening to Pop Culture Cosmos Podcast. For the latest news and information, analysis and opinions on the Los Angeles Lakers and the NBA, check out the Lakers Fast Break Podcast today on wherever you get your podcasts. My friend, there's so much more to talk about on today's program. Wanted to go ahead and let you know on an interview that Sasha Baron Cohen did quite recently in speaking about the making of Borat 2, the circumstances around that as far as how tough it was to make, obviously the, the content involved within it. I know you and I spoke highly of it, and I thought it was actually one of the top five movies for me for 2020 was Borat 2. And Maria Bakalova, I think, is deserving of Academy Award consideration because her performance was so sensational in it. But the alarming thing that came out of the interview was that he has no plans at all for Borat 3. And one of the things I had said upon seeing Borat 2 was that, you know what, Amazon better back up the Brinks truck 
You did say that. I remember that. Yeah. I, and I thought for sure that better back up that Brinks truck because it did a huge amount of money for Amazon Prime. It did a huge amount of business, a huge amount of viewership for Amazon Prime. Everybody was talking about it. It was so controversial, so funny, so good of a movie. But his comments kind of make me concerned. I don't think he's doing the hard play for Amazon Prime because, again, he could write his own ticket and he could write his own check on Amazon Prime now, right now, if he said, yeah, let's go ahead with a four at three. Yeah. He might have other characters in mind, but they've never connected quite as well as Borat. So I want to hear your thoughts on the possibility, which is a strong possibility, which you and I know, let's say never and never. I mean, you can never say never in Hollywood because again, you know, if you back the Brinks truck up enough, you can dish out enough money where anybody will say yes. But as of right now, there's no Borat 3 in sight. And I think that's quite concerning if you're a fan of the series. Yeah, I'd be concerned. But maybe there's a bigger point here is, uh, you know, the reason why he revived Borat and, and brought Borat too was he felt like democracy was in peril. That's one of the big quotes I remember seeing from the interview. I would hope that we don't have to see a Borat 3. You know, the events really? that are going on. Yeah, I would hope that we don't have You, you to. wouldn't want another five, seven years down the line, then you wouldn't want to see one again? I would hope that we're doing better, that we don't need another Borat to oh, remind that, us. Touching maybe on other subjects, on other ways, on other things. Just a Borat character in and of itself. Yeah, it's, it's hard, though. That character has always been geared at political commentary and social commentary, really. And so it's, it's hard. Uh, I, I guess if you wanted to to take it down a social commentary route, you know, for Borat three, I'm sure that's entirely possible, but it's, it's really hard to get away from his political under and overtones, you know, and, and it's, it's one of those things that, uh, yes, I would enjoy Borat three. I'm going to sit there and laugh, but I would hope, and I'm, this is my hope for, you know, our society is that we don't need a Borat three in five years or seven years, whatever it is, 10 or 15. I can't say I disagree with you on that statement. You're right. In and of itself, I'm, I'm hoping that a Borat three will not be necessitated but Borat two was so well done. You, you hope <laughs> that he can, fo- you hope that he can follow it up with something, something that that clicks with an audience because Bruno, Ali G, you know, Ali G is this- an amazing character. I mean, it's just, it's it just never- they haven't connected. They yeah. haven't connected on a on a worldwide basis like like Borat. And I'm not sure if he has anything else up the sleeve besides Borat that's going to connect with an audience at such a large volume right yeah and that's i think that's the the issue he's going to have moving forward but i mean he's been doing a lot of serious movies and tv shows uh maybe not tv shows movies though lately and i'm I'm really kind of looking forward to see what he does after this and really keep developing himself and not to say he needs to develop any further because i think he's an outstanding actor and it's evident by the way that he's able to embody the characters that he does but you know, I'm I'm hoping that we get to see something else, a little more creative out of him, and not, yeah, a little more creative out of him, a little bit more. I don't want to call it serious because I mean, Bort has its serious moments uh, as when it comes to the social. Well, with his efforts in Trial of Chicago Seven, which is also getting a lot of acclaim. Yeah, and I mean, also could be up for an award for just for that. I mean, his future really as an actor movie, is good. Yeah, he has a great future as, with everything else that he touches. I'm sure, and it's just going to be one of those things. I don't want to see another Borat 3, but if we do, it's going to be outstanding. You know it's going to be. And I mean, the writing has always been great on Borat. So hopefully we don't have to. But if he does, I, I'm hoping he cooks up something outstanding. I hope he does as well. That's going to connect with a large audience like he did with Borat 2. Even surpassing the success, in my opinion, of Borat 1. It's, it's a much better movie for me. Borat 2 is. I think it was a much yeah. better watch overall. And again, Maria Bakalova, I mean, I don't know for where her career is going to go next, but I hope it, that this will be the rocket ship for her, that her career will take off because she is certainly deserving of it. Because as someone who is almost relatively new, basically she was relatively new to the to the whole acting world. Yeah. And this is her first real role in, in feature film. And to go out there and match toe for toe, with Sasha Baron Cohen in this film was truly an outstanding feat. I mean, a lot of other actors and actresses period would have been maybe intimidated, would have been downplayed and would have not chance, not given that full chance or would have not taken the steps to that. They, that maybe Maria Bakalova did because Maria Bakalova basically went all out 
And that's why it's so good, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree with you there. It's She really sold out, I think. But grabbing somebody that was a little bit less experienced, a little bit more un, or a lot more unknown was the smart move there for Borat too. You know, you ended up with somebody that was willing to go the distance, right? You know, willing to play the part, go to the extremes and do everything that they needed to do. And so that alone was what made her performance special. And it's it's going to be... For me, I agree with you. It was the highlight of the film, just seeing her kind of really go full out and just full sail on it. I enjoyed my time with Borat 2, and apparently there will not be Borat 3. I'm like you. Uh, I, you know, once you've brought me around to it, I'm now hoping that there will not be a need for a Borat 3 because it will say a lot about, again, the w- way the world is, the way the U.S. is at, the way society is as a whole, if there is a Borat 3 on the horizon. But I'm assuming Amazon is still backing up the Brinks truck for something that Sasha Baron Cohen has up his sleeve. But again, if it's not Borat related, the question now becomes, will he have a character or an idea or a concept that's going to connect as large as Borat? That's been the question going forward. We haven't seen as of yet, even though he's had good performances in other roles and other formats. I'm questioning whether that's going to be the case and he has something that will connect on that larger scale again. It's, it's an uphill battle for that, Gerald. And and that's one of those things that, you know, Sasha Baron Cohen is going to be, I don't want to say he's going to struggle to top this in his career because, I mean, he's got so many things that he's done and done well. So it's it'll be interesting to see what comes next. I'm with you. What are your thoughts out there on Sasha Baron Cohen stating in a recent interview that, was it with, was it with Variety? Or was it was it with New Variety. York? Yep. Was with Variety. Okay. Yep. That he has no plans for a Borat three anytime in the near future or in the distant future, for that matter. So we want to hear your thoughts. Are you bummed to hear like No Ian Fine was when we m- mentioned it just now on the show, and he commented on that that there is no Borat three on the horizon. Share us your thoughts. Pop culture cosmos at yahoo.com. Wanted to go ahead and talk real quick about Movo's VSM7, the condenser microphone that I got a chance to test out recently. It's a nice studio microphone. It is not USB, which is, to me, one of the major detractions from it because every, these days a lot of microphones need to be USBs because everywhere just likes plugging in on the go. This is, though, a very solid condenser microphone with multi-diaphragm as far as whether you're doing out a cardioid or whether you're expanding it for an entire group audience. Does a solid job. I've got a review of it coming up this week at popculturecosmos.com. So look for that. Gets a very solid review for me. And if you're interested in buying a large scale studio microphone like this, it is the Movo VSM7. You can check it out today on Amazon and other major retailers. It is the Movo VSM7. It is something that I do recommend, and I'll be giving a full review of it this week on the popculturecosmos.com website for for you. So hopefully you'll get a chance to check that out. Truly enjoyed my time with it. But before we head on to the break, I got to throw this by you. It came out that in the year 2000 that Microsoft sent out feelers to Nintendo about acquiring them. So Microsoft was actually half-heartedly interested in purchasing Nintendo. Now, Nintendo laughed that off, and that was the general reaction that was given to them. But there could have been a possibility in some alternate plane that Microsoft could have owned Nintendo. How weird is that? I can't imagine that the development timeline for Nintendo, you know, whether it's the GameCube, the Switch, the N64, that no, the N64 was out already. The Wii came after the the Wii. Yeah, I I can't imagine the development profile for any of that would be the same if Microsoft owned Nintendo. You know, it's one of those things uh, that I don't think an American company would have done great with the history that Nintendo had and commitment to their consumer, man. It would have been a shame to see. And I'm glad that Nintendo laughed off the offer because it might have made all of them better, right? you know, put Xbox in a position where they couldn't just rely on buying a studio to compete or buying a company to compete. And now that Microsoft does have all the money in the world to do that, and they're doing it successfully, I hope they continue to do it successfully. You know, they've got their recent acquisition of ZeniMax that they're trying to complete. It's going to be seven and a half billion dollars. I just can't imagine spending that much to buy a studio to grab a hold of IP like that. But I mean, it's great IP. It's Fallout. It's Doom. It's who else? 
I can't think of anybody else off the top of my head. The well, Elder Scrolls, I mean, the Elder yeah. Scrolls, Fallout, the whole nine yards. But when it comes to that, I mean, you got to figure as well. Seven and a half billion dollars. It only took four billion to buy Star Wars and Marvel each. So you got to yeah. put that in perspective. Yeah, that's it's wild to me that they're spending seven and a half billion B billion dollars on Zenimax, but. I mean, it tells you about the profitability of gaming, right? And and the rise and and the direction in which we're heading. You know, it's one of those things I think we'll get into when we get to the best of 2020 and what we're looking forward to with 2021. We're gonna see really the development of brands and everything. I kind of lost my train of thought there. It doesn't matter. It does. <laughs> Microsoft buying Nintendo. I'm glad it didn't go through at the time, and I'm glad Nintendo laughed it off. Well, it led to Xbox having to earn their way into gamers respectability yeah. as far as with the original Xbox and then the Xbox 360 and then the Xbox one and now the Xbox series X, which I think now a lot of people are finally starting to give a lot of respect to. Obviously it's still hard to find out there on shelves and internet retailers and the like still can't find it along with a PlayStation five. I think once you start seeing games, that you will get a better idea about the Xbox Series X and where it's headed. I'm interested right now of the two simply because of the fact that the Xbox has a little bit more power on the hood. But for me, it's a close call on either one. And Nancy Weems says, coffee, anyone? Well, maybe Marcus needs a little bit of shot of coffee. I know I'm... I do, but you know what? I'll go ahead and have some hot chocolate here after the show today. But yes, when it comes to Microsoft, I mean, Microsoft, that whole concept of buying Nintendo and the culture where it's based. I could have seen Sony buying Nintendo after the early nineties battle that happened. And then Nintendo Mm -hmm. dissing Sony with the PlayStation deal, as far as that's concerned, then PlayStation ending up saying, okay, we'll just go ahead and make it ourselves. And they ended up being a great success to the point where Nintendo at the earlier part of the century in the two thousands, Look like Sony could have bought Nintendo because Nintendo was struggling with the GameCube and Sony was wreaking havoc with the PlayStation and the PlayStation 2. If any company could have bought out Nintendo, it could have been Sony. Yeah, and that would have been an interesting deal as well. It's more based in culture that that would have been more acceptable. Yeah, I guess so. But uh, I, I appreciate Nintendo remaining independent, doing their own thing. And oh, I do their, too. I mean, they got yeah, a lot of money in the, the coffers, so it'd be really hard to, to find a price tag that would work. I totally agree with that point. You, you have to look at their success over time and know that you know any offer that anybody could have come to them with at that time probably would have been laughed off at that point. So, I mean, it, 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 it's barred, you know, somebody backing up a Brinks truck full of uh, gold bars, I'm sure that's... That's <laughs> that's it. Well, the right thing there. is, you got to remember for every uh, failure that they've had with the Wii U and also as well the GameCube, they've had tremendous successes with yeah. the Switch currently. Yep. And then they had the Wii, which was a sensation almost unlike anything else out that's out there. You know, maybe the PlayStation 2 and maybe another system or two might, might qualify as being close to that type of sensation. But the Wii was something that everybody needed to have in 2007 and 2008. And everybody was begging for it and lining up around the block for that for for months and months and months. And you had the N64 and the original NES that people were truly interested in. Those systems, they buoyed the company so much, they've got a lot of room on their plate to go ahead and say, you know what, we're going to take a chance on this and we'll fail maybe. But again, we should have another success of mine because we do have that money to go ahead and back that up. They cut the Wii U short once they saw it was not going to be a long-term success and came out with the Switch, which was for them a brilliant move simply because of the fact that they have the almost seemingly infinite resources to do so. Right. Yeah, I'm glad they made the moves that they did on the Wii U. It shows a healthy leadership for the company, right? It shows a, a leadership team that understands profitability and how to make things really resonate with their consumers. So I'm glad that we cut short. We brought in the Nintendo Switch, and I'm really excited to see what they do after this. If you look at what they did with the Wii and how we integrated workout games and our entertainment sector here, I would like to see what Nintendo is going to do to push the envelope moving forward. So will I, my friend. I'm interested to see what the future holds for not only Microsoft and Sony with the PlayStation and Xbox series, 
that are coming up. Hopefully at E3, we'll get a better idea. Maybe even next week at CES, we can get a little taste of what's going on. But I'm also looking forward to what Nintendo has in the offering right around E3 time and seeing what their future for them as well. Now that the Switch is the old system on the block right now, which is kind of funny to say because at one time they were the new system, but in a matter of weeks, they've turned out to have an even older system now that still endures, that still people love to play. But we're going to see what the long-term future for Nintendo Switch is going to be, hopefully within the next year to 18 months that we'll see how that develops. But I'm excited for that. And it all could have been a Microsoft purchase way long ago. So I'm glad that they decided not to go ahead and let that happen. I'm looking forward to going ahead and seeing what the future of the video game industry will be like in 2021. But knowing that Microsoft at one time was halfway serious about buying Nintendo, I'm kind of glad it didn't work out that way. What are your thoughts out there on Nintendo possibly being bought by Microsoft way back in 2000? Would you have been surprised that that happened? Would you have been shocked? Would you have been angry back in 2000? Share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Well, coming up next, it is Jonathan Gatsby. He is the author of The Beast and the Four Demigods. He comes up right after the break to talk about his book and how he is going to try and get you to go ahead and check out this series, which he hopes will become the next great fantasy series. And he comes up right after the break to do just that. This is the PCC Multiverse. Video game box art, the stories behind the covers in which we talk to the illustrators and artists who are responsible for gaming's most iconic images. Don't forget to check out Video Game Box Art, the stories behind the covers, celebrating gaming's most iconic images from the people who created them. This and many more from Rob McCallum Films. We're back with the show and Sterile Glass. We're coming right back at you here on the Pop Culture Cosmos. We truly appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening and watching as always. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go into a little bit different venture for our interview this week. I'm so excited to talk to our next guest here. He has got a line of books right now, which you got to check out, starting with one that just came out last month. So hopefully you get a chance to check it out. It is available on Amazon.com. It is called The Beasts and the Four Demigods. That's The Beasts and the Four Demigods right there for you. In fact, let me go ahead and give you a little bit of an intro in it as part of the description I'm going to just go ahead and try and get the mood for you for if you're into fantasy and that type of lore. Let me go ahead and give this a shot. The world of the gods is in deep unrest. And an unlikely Chicago foursome have been bestowed with the power to end the troubles for good. In the first of seven tournaments, they must take on a most fearsome array of the gods' beasts in order to prevent history from repeating itself and putting human civilization at risk once again it's the beast and the four demigods hopefully you get a chance to check it out today at amazon.com it is mr jonathan gatsby and jonathan thanks for joining us on today's show oh yeah thank, thank you for having me great job I try my best on that I try my best i saw <laughs> that and when it comes to fantasy series of similar ilk i mean there's been a lot of interest going back to harry potter and then you go into so many mm -hmm. others that have come out in the past two decades if you yeah. can just go into a little bit of a backstory about how the series came about i need to get arrested a couple of times to tell you that when i was locked up uh, so i started reading and um i read harry potter series and other stuff and i decided you know i want to write while i was in there and so i asked the guard mr green for 15 pieces of paper and i started writing Oh, that's a great story right there for you. And obviously it shows that you've had this love for this type of fantasy world, which once again, it's the Beast and the Four Demigods. It is now available at Amazon.com. But tell me if you can, as far as the type of things you want to discover, not only with this book that you just came out with, but the type of things you want people to discover as far as this world of fantasy that you've created with the Demigod series. Okay. Um there was a few aspects that I wanted to bring out. In. One was, you know, you have different settings everywhere you go. I've gone to like suburb schools, you know, where good schools, and I've gone to schools where they had metal detectors. And so, you know, I've gone to both schools, and I, you know, I kind of want to get both sides. That's why the demigod 
they're not all one, you know, group. Like one Jimmy got is homeless, living on the street, but he's trying to graduate. Another one is uh, in the, uh, two of them live in the suburbs. One lives in the ghetto. They're all from the south side of Chicago. And um, I just wanted to get different aspects, you know, as far as, uh, you know, uh, people's lifestyles and how they live or going into it. So these four teens are trying to, you know, trying to graduate the school. You know, that's already hard enough, you know, um, at certain schools. And then on top of that, they're kind of forced into, they find out the demigod. Find out that along with having powers, you have responsibility. And so it brings up the question, like, you know, um, is having powers even worth it, you know, if you're putting your life at risk? And so what I wanted to do, and this part's where it gets a little controversial. I, I've always been wanting to go against the mold, <laughs> but uh, I grew up in Baptist church. I am a Baptist preacher. But at the same time, I always have opened my mind to look at other stuff, kind of, you know, so I can understand everything, you know. And so I would study everything. And then in doing so, I actually started finding a lot of connections in between everything. Greek, Norse, Egyptian, even in, in, in the Bible. I found links in each one of them where they were referencing each other. So in a book, what I did, I picked a study. I had the Demi guys kind of studying it while they're learning about the power. So you actually see the studies that I was doing as they're going through. I'll tell you what, it, it provides the, the basis and the foundation for an interesting storyline that you've already got underway. And hopefully <laughs> people will go ahead and check out The Beast and the Four Demigods. Just came out in December it is available now on Amazon.com. Obviously, that's something that you're working on is expanding this series even more. And you find a lot of inspiration that I, I'm so encouraged by hearing you in your story so far and what I've read and what's been sent out to me. And I, I appreciate, again, all the time that you're taking and speaking to me today for it. But tell me, where do you want this series to go? How do you want this series to develop in your mind? I know you already have it mapped out. I mean, obviously, the great authors such as yourself that that they work on these series and they already have a, a a timeline, a byline about how the basics are drawn out. I mean, do you think this will go a long ways? Yeah, I was planning on seven books, but right now I'm thinking it's probably going to be about eight. Because I don't want to make any book too long, too lengthy a book to turn some readers off. So I figure I want to keep each one of them about between 300 and 400 pages. And so I'm th thinking about seven or eight books. I'm already about halfway done with the third book right now in that series. I have another series out, uh, World War III. That book's getting republished coming up this next month. To be honest with you, when I started this, as you probably already read, I, I was poor as a kid. I decided to get good at certain things, basketball, boxing. I was a professional boxer for a little bit. Music, I got some songs out. This was my passion, the books. But the whole the whole goal from the get-go was just, you know, I, I don't want to live poor my whole life. I, I wanted you know, to, to get to the point I can get comfortable. Um, I have a daughter now, and so now the goals need to change now. So now, if I don't, you know, get you know, get to that point where I'm good, I'm hoping it does it for my daughter, so she'll be able to, you know, go to college. She's in fifth grade. She's always been top of the class, and they even tried to advance her a couple grades up. She's actually doing uh, eighth, ninth grade work right now, working in fifth grade, and well, so I know awesome. she wants to go to college. Well, I'll tell you what, I wish you all the best of that as a father of two girls myself that I would like oh, to nice, go ahead nice. and put through college. That's very intimidating. Uh, I know that's out there. And it is something as a parent, you always want your kids to strive for the best. And it sounds like your your daughter is doing just that. So my wholehearted congratulations to you on that. And she has a dad that is hopefully going to be able to be very successful with his book series. And it's something very fascinating that people need to take a look into but again, Jonathan Gatsby, author of, again of The Beast and the Four Demigods that you can get right now on Amazon.com. I truly wish you tremendous success, and I can't not thank you enough for being part of the show. Any last thoughts on the way out? Yeah, I just want to thank Kevin to make sure that it's this cover. Amazon's not taking the old one down yet because I guess people were still buying it. That's never a bad thing when people still buy your previous edition books. Yeah. But again, it, look for the one that's dated for this past year, December 2nd, 2020. Yeah. That's its original release date. It is The Beast and the Four Demigods. It is available right now on Amazon.com. But I want to tell you what, Jonathan, it's been great having you on the show. We truly appreciate everyone that's watching, listening. And again, Jonathan, we truly appreciate you being part of the pop culture cosmos.
If you need your video game fix, be sure to check out Retro City Games. Located in Town Square on Las Vegas Boulevard or in Henderson, Nevada, Retro City Games has the cure for all your video game vices. Retro games and games for current consoles, Nintendo, Sega, PlayStation, Xbox, and more. Retro City Games has all the staples from any library and some highly collectible offerings too. So pick up a few games today at Retro City Games in Town Square on Las Vegas Boulevard or in Henderson, Nevada. Retro City Games is your video game metropolis. And we're back to close out the show. This is the PCC Multiverse. My good friend has returned to us. It is Mr. Marcus De La Garza. I do want to thank Jonathan Gatsby from The Beast and the Four Demigods, which is available now on Amazon.com, the author of that, for stopping by on today's program. And I wish him tremendous success with his book series as he continues to do that. And please check out his book, The Beast and the Four Demigods, today on Amazon. But before we head on out, my friend, the floor is now yours. You weren't here for the end of 2020 because you were zooming all over the place. You were jet setting. Just Safely. All over the place. <laughs> so I want to hear your thoughts. The floor is yours, my friend. You get up on that soapbox. You can tell me. What intrigued you the most? What entertained you? What excited you the most in 2020? And what are you looking forward to here in 2021? All right. Not the most conventional list here, but I'm going to start out with, and I know you knew this one was coming, Ted Lasso. Of course. What a wonderful show. Can we just talk about it for a minute? I think it was an outstanding show. It really brought some, uh, I don't know, much needed comedy. And it was a little bit of that dry British humor, but at the same time, it was still Jason Sudeikis being a zany character and really appealing to you and just making you smile, man. And I I know that didn't do it for you, but it did it for a lot of people. It did it for enough people that they were renewed for season two and season three. Right. That is correct. Yes. It was actually a number one for Apple TV in several markets around the world. I'm not going to try and dissuade that. I know it's a popular show. I know it's been a successful hit. I know a lot of critics like it. I have seen the list. It just didn't connect with me. And I don't know why. Maybe I I thought it was just like another Saturday Night Live skit that they've tried to length out. I've said that previously on the show. For me, it just didn't click. But that's not to say I'm not happy for you that it didn't click. I want it to click with people out there, even if I don't like it. Josh and I go back and forth on shows that he didn't like or that I liked and that he liked that I didn't like. All the time. You know, King Arthur to this day is still a sore spot for both of us. So, you know, Ted Lasso, again, I'm so happy for you that you enjoyed it and that you had a great experience from it. Yeah, it was definitely one of those things that it changed 2020 a little bit for me in the sense of it gave me something that I was looking forward to to watch in the evenings. And that was one of those ones in our discussion about binging things earlier. You know, we were a little bit late to the party, I think. And so we had a couple episodes built up, but then we had to wait with the rest of the crew, man. And it was worth it. I I binged through the first four or five episodes with my wife, Jamie. And after episode five, we had to calm down and wait just like everybody else. And it was well worth the wait. You know, it was one of those things my mom was visiting at the time while it was still airing. And we got her to watch the first episode. And I think we binged three or four more after that. And it was just a great experience. You know, it was one of those things that it came at at a much needed time. And I'm very grateful for it. This is my first unconventional of the night. Rise of great takeout. You know, this is a year where we saw a lot of weird things happen, you know, across the board with pandemic and the economy and everything that's going on. And I'm very grateful to all those essential workers that stayed out to make sure that we were well taken care of. We were well fed. We were well shopped for. Anything you think of was taken care of for us. But I do want to say rise of great takeout. I've had plenty of restaurants here in Tampa Bay that I've always wanted to just be able to order something, pick it up, take it home, hang out and relax on my couch and eat their wonderful food. And that's one of the things that I was able to do this year. You know, I'm trying to take some lemons and turn it into some lemonade here. And and that's I do want to say that Rise of Great Takeout and my ability to support my, my favorite local restaurants, make sure that they were able to continue working and, and continue making some of the best food that I've had in a while. That really did make a difference for me after about week four or five of the pandemic and staying home and eating in, you know, eating in every night and doing everything yourself. And it was nice to take a little bit of a break. And so I I very much appreciate everyone that has served me food throughout this year. But moving on, the plants and pets in our lives. That was one of my best for 2020. And this is going to sound crazy, but we stocked up on plants in our household. We've got succulents galore. I will take pictures and put them on Twitter if anybody's actually interested. But my wife really took on a passion for succulents this year. Our our house is very green now. 
I'm kind of looking around and looking at all the stuff that's up in our living room, but it looks wonderful, man. And so just the, the small things like that. And then getting back to pop culture, though, I do have to say the expanse. And it's going to be my bridge into 2021, actually, because it is existing both in 2020 and 2021. I want to say that if you haven't taken the time to watch any of the episodes that have come out so far, season five on The Expanse, it's been outstanding. It's really captivated the audience. The reviews have been great. And I'm really looking forward to see how they wrap up the storyline for this season. We're doing some great things as far as when you look at the book versus the TV show, we're really bringing in some storylines. We're moving things forward a lot faster than they happen in the books. But it's going to allow us to keep the characters that we know and love. We don't have to intentionally age them and try and make them look older than they are. We're really adapting the storyline to make it continuous, man. It's, it's one of those things that if you, and I don't want to spoil for anyone, but there are some major events that happen in this season and have tremendous impact on Earth. So if you are as much of a sci-fi nerd as I am, please, please, please take some time to support The Expanse. They've got a sixth and final season coming on Amazon Prime hopefully next December, but I'm going to go ahead and <laughs> put my bets on 2022. It's hard to, to film things during pandemics. And, you know, we've seen the effects of that across 2020. I will say my least favorite of 2020 was push timelines. And I think we, <laughs> we've heard me say that too many times last year. So I'm hoping that we talk about those less in 2021. And here's the one I'm hoping that we don't see any more push timelines on. I'm looking forward to James Bond, the new James Bond movie in 2021. Whenever it releases, Gerald, I'm going to be losing my mind. No time to die. No time to die, man. It's it's one of those things that, you know, when the Billie Eilish song came out for the Bond movie, I just was nonstop on that song. And I, 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 admittedly, I've been nonstop on Billie Eilish. She was outstanding in 2020. And I mean, really in 2019, because I think that's when Where Do We Go When We Fall Asleep came out, her album. That song captivated me. I've always loved Daniel Craig as a Bond. You know, Pierce Brosnan was my Bond growing up as a child, but Daniel Craig has been great. You know, my wife and I differ on a couple of the movies, but I'm really looking forward to see how he rounds out his appearance in the franchise because it's it's something that I don't want to say it's owed to him, but I think he's he's earned the ability to go out on an outstanding movie. And I hope Bond No Time to Die is going to be that. Again, it's something that I'm interested in now. Daniel Craig was at first a slow burn for me as far as being that Bond I could truly appreciate. And I've now grown to really admire the character. I think Skyfall did it for me as it did for a lot of other people. That's why it's the most successful Bond movie ever because it's such a great movie and he did so well in it that I now look forward to movies outside of the Bond universe from him. Uh, Obviously, he's done with Knives Out and Lucky Logan. That was a really great movie and a really great performance by him. He really catapulted the movie. Oh, Logan Lucky. Logan Logan Lucky. Lucky. Yeah, Yeah. Logan Lucky, the Steven Soderbergh film, who Steven Soderbergh always seems to go in retirement and then comes out of it and makes a film like that. Yeah. (laughs) So uh, Logan Lucky was a, a truly great film and his performance, and it was good. So I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what Daniel Craig gives one last effort to the Bond films because this will be the last time we see them in a 007 moniker. At least that's what they're saying. That's what they're billing it as, the last effort for him. And they're going to transition it to a new 007. Who will that be? Only speculation is there. So we'll have to wait and see on that one. But I am looking forward to the final effort for Daniel Craig in the role of James Bond 007 in No Time to Die. But what else are you looking forward to in 2021? Man, I'm really looking forward to the Olympics. I hope they actually get to happen in terms of what's going on in the world and pop culture. The Olympics every two years, you know, whether it's the winter or the summer, Jamie and I have talked about taking time off work to make sure that we're able to catch all the events. That's how much of an important event it is in our household. And so I'm really hoping that we are able to go with the 2021 Olympics now. was supposed to be 2020, but that hinges on something that... I'm also anticipating for 2021, it's the widespread distribution of the vaccine, you know, and it's one of those things that I know this is a highly anticipated thing for most everybody in the world, <laughs> but I'm going to put it on my list, man. It's, it's, it's very important. It's very important things uh, to all of us. And so, you know, I, I will share this with everyone. I'm, I'm very excited about it, anticipating it and, and looking forward to my chance to get my dosage. So to you and I both, my friend. Just stepping back to the Olympics for a second, you know, whatever they have to do to modify it, you know, whether or not they're going to allow the athletes to stay in the Olympic Village the entire time. You know, some of the plans I've read are that they'll only bring athletes in in groups. 
and let those groups compete and then dish them all out and then sanitize and bring the next group in that kind of thing. Whatever they end up doing, I hope it's successful. I hope they get a chance to actually do it. And I will have all the reviews when we get there, man. <laughs> the only thing I ask you this is because last time they tried to do pay-per-view, plus they combined CNBC, MSNBC, and of course, NBC, the whole bunch of this. And they're obviously going to intermix some of that again. But instead of pay-per-view, they're going to throw a lot of this on Peacock, which is supposed to be their version of Wonder Woman 1984. If the office doesn't do it for you as far as bringing in new viewers do you think it's going to be the windfall of success for Peacock? Because again, it comes down to add what type of events, what type of coverage are you sending the way of Peacock? That to me is the thing I think that's going to stick out. If it's something like side sports or break dancing, I'm not going to be watching the break dancing event per se. You know, at least I'm not going to go out of my way to watch it. It might show up on my TV, but some of the other events that are out there, you know, that are not very popular it's going to be a very hard watch for me does peacock get stuck with all those or do they get some prime things that are normally watched by a lot of people like the track and field the marathon basketball you know some of the events that are there that take shape that are truly followed by a lot of people and would be a big boost to peacock that's the big question i have well, I'm hoping that we kind of keep embracing the brands and channels that we have already from a network perspective, right? You know, in, in the umbrella that is NBC, we've got NBC Sportsnet, we've got the Olympics channel or the Olympic channel, I think is what they actually call it. You know, I know that we're going to be putting content on Peacock. You know, they've already admitted it. I hope they don't get saddled with all the worst events, you know, but if they do... You're the new kid on the block, but I hope that's not their business strategy because their business strategy should be that they put some of the prime events over on Peacock to garner that viewership, give people a two-week free trial during the Olympics, suck them in that way, and they'll never leave, right? You know, from a business perspective, put some of those nice things on Peacock, people will sign up. And just like gym memberships, they'll never cancel. So if you can do the same thing there, do it and, and make it great. But I'm hoping that we can kind of stick to some of the, the channels and, and highways that we have for delivering entertainment. Well, it has to be for them in order to go ahead, because this is their opportunity. I mean, if the office doesn't do it with all the extra footage and exclusive stuff that they have that Netflix didn't have, if that doesn't do it for you, which I think a lot of people will do because the office on Netflix was such a tremendous success. And it was the number one overall year by year series that was watched on the outlet. And I'm sure they're going to get a big boost from that, but they don't have original content that they can really draw in people and say by the bell, the reboot is not going to do it for people, but something like the Olympics can something like showing the track and field on Peacock can something like showing the basketball finals on Peacock can, but you're going to have to sacrifice showing it on NBC and that's a trade-off because you spend so much money on it with advertisers and things of that nature. So I'm not sure that they're going to do that. I'm think when it comes down to push and shove, you've got so much advertising involved. If that's the case that they're probably going to show most of the good stuff on NBC. But to me, if they're going to go ahead and think long-term future for what Peacock could be, it would probably be in their best interest to do what HBO Max did and just putting premium content right now or right away yep. when it's released on that platform. Simple as that. They should follow that same footsteps. And if they don't, they're going to end up really on the short end of the stick on subscribers and subscriptions by the end of the year. Yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to see how Peacock develops over 2021. If they could find a way to sneak into my next bullet point for 2021, they could be doing pretty well. The rise of the lifestyle companies or the lifestyle brand, right? And it's anti-Apple Alliance. So they were looking at three companies specifically, Spotify, Peloton, Netflix. If you could group together and offer a package deal of those three, you could start competing with Apple right away because Spotify knocks out Apple Music. Peloton would knock out the Apple fitness app that they just launched and Netflix would knock out Apple TV. So I'm send me a free Peloton. Okay. Send me a free Peloton. I'm going at it. Yeah. I would say goodbye to Apple. Send me that free Peloton. I will go ahead and move out my existing exercise bike and I will go ahead and put in the Peloton there, but you got to send me it free. 
that's the problem is you're not going to get it free. You can't even get it, period. You know, if it was six months ago, it was one of those things that it was hard to find a Peloton. You were trying to find one that was used and refurbish it because pandemic just made them all disappear overnight, basically. But I'm really, really, really looking forward to the concept of this rise of lifestyle brands and the, and the banding together of brands to maybe take on some of the larger competitors. Healthy competition is what we need in this marketplace right now. The sooner we have that, the better we all are. And I want to leave you with something here, Gerald. Okay. You, you can leave for this one? Never, but go ahead anyways. Ted Lasso season two. That's my hopes for 2021. If Apple can saying. deliver... In December, you know, maybe December 15th, I'm, I'm not requesting anything, Apple, but if you would like to, December 15th, drop Ted Lasso 2 and just give us a nice little Christmas present there. It would be a really great way to send out the year, especially a year that we're hoping is going to be outstanding. And so give us an outstanding TV show to send us out. I do want to say I've got an honorable mention that I forgot to include in 2020, Dave on FXX, but it was about Lil Dicky the rapper and it's about his life kind of, but it's it's all highly fictionalized and you know, just an outstanding show. It really made us laugh in, in our household. And it, it was a laugh we needed for, I guess that was April, May, maybe May, June. So, you know, it, it got us through until Ted Lasso came out. And then we really went hard after Ted Lasso. Well, I'm glad you got a chance to enjoy it. That is, again, Dave, you got to check that out on FXX. It is something that I think a lot of people have been talking about. So hopefully they'll give that a shot. And I'm looking forward to more great things. Maybe a little bit less of Justin Bieber, but you never know uh, when it comes to FXX and Dave. But, you know, uh, we can go ahead and let the Bieber in for an episode. Now, now, if he's in on the joke, that's OK. It's OK. Yeah, yeah, obviously. And it seems like Justin Bieber is actually willing to laugh at himself now. And well, that's that, good. Yeah, I mean, that brings things full circle. As soon as it you can does. laugh at yourself, the better you are in pop culture. And as for Ted Lasso, season two, I have a feeling it will come out this year. But you got to put me on my free Peloton first before I see it, man. Before I see it, I need that free Peloton. I mean, it's not going to be free, but I can definitely get you one right now. It's it's going to cost you, though. No, no, no. <laughs> I like that free. You got to send it to me free. You know, if like, you want that package in there, I'll pay the monthly subscription if you send that free Peloton. But you know, you know, I it, you know what it comes down to is we need to make sure we're, we're really hitting up Peloton and embracing their product and seeing if they want to send us a review unit. So there you go. Uh, I'm trying to get I'm a KFC Peloton. console. I'm trying to get a KFC console and review that. So you and I both, you and I both, that would be awesome <laughs> indeed. But you and I will also hopefully get a chance next week at CES to meet a lot of people. So you never know what they'll be gracious enough to allow us to check out. So I'm looking forward to that as well next week for CS, but I'm glad that you're anticipating a lot of great things. Some things that are off the beaten path, which I kind of like, and some yep. things right on the beaten path when it comes to pop culture. What are you looking forward to in pop culture in 2021? We want to hear your thoughts. PopCultureCosmos at Yahoo.com. Well, my friend, it's been a great episode. Back in the big chair once again, and glad to have you back after your jet-setting ways are done. At least for now, and I'm glad you're safe. Yep. Glad you're healthy. Taking the big risk out there. We are. You know that we is. Did. We did. But I, I'm glad to have you back indeed. And next week we will be back with more good stuff here at the multiverse. Plus, also Monday show, we're going to be talking more about all the great things that are going on in pop culture. Josh and I will return. Plus, I will have interviews coming up with award-winning director and my pesterer as far as it's concerned my terrorizer shall i say my good friend indeed it is mr rob mccallum he's back to talk action figure adventures and nice. video game box art that's a series that you got to catch now on amazon that is video game box art the stories behind the covers on amazon check that out but yes definitely looking forward to that plus also some other great interviews as well any last thoughts on the way out on the way out, I do want to say thank you to Nancy Williams and Noah Ian Fine for their steadfast support of the podcast and always being around for the live interviews. On top of that, Happy New Year, folks. Really looking forward to a great 2021. Please reach out to me on Twitter, on, on Instagram. Let me know what you're looking forward to in 2021. Let's have a dialogue. We've got some news that we got to discuss as far as you know, Twitter buying some podcast services, and, and it might make it easier for us all to converse in 2021. I'm going to sit on that one until next week, and then we can discuss it a little bit further. Sounds good. Twitter needs to buy us. 
We need the cashola. No, we, we need do. to buy the pop culture costumes. We got thousands of people that have listened to us, tens of thousands of people. We mm-hmm. need. We, 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 we. We're on 30 stations worldwide. Twitter, send that money over here, please. You well, need to send it our way. They might be. I mean, they just bought a whole podcasting technology. So we'll see how they integrate it into their social media platform. And maybe we can start having some live conversations with people as we record. We will see what the Twitter has in store for us right here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. So for Marcus De La Garza, this is Gerald Glassford. It's another beautiful day in paradise right here in the PCC multiverse. We thank you for listening. And here's hoping you have yourself a great Than a new day pancake. More fun than a super kick party. It's the wrestling podcast from the host who is the hammer swinging, burrito eating, well, you know the rest of Thunder Talk. <laughs> Sexy Thor! It's the Ring of Thunder found in the Thunderverse and among the great podcasts of the ESO Network. You're listening to a Weeby Geeks Network podcast. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Tangent Bound Network. Let your voice be heard. TangentBoundNetwork.com Thanks so much for downloading the Pop Culture Cosmos and stay tuned as more great podcasts are on the way. Thanks again for listening to us here at the Pop Culture Cosmos.